Hello, everyone. This is Mr. Millette with an AP World History presentation. Today's presentation is all about industrialization. As much as revolutions like the American Revolution, the French Revolution, the Haitian Slave Revolt, and the various Latin American revolutions altered the lives of people throughout the Atlantic world, it can be argued that industrialization was a far greater impactful revolution on humanity. Political idealism did not tend to trickle down to the masses, quite like technological, economic, and social change seemed to do in the 18th and 19th centuries. This presentation will look at reasons why many of the world's societies underwent industrialization. It will also differentiate between different periods of industrialization throughout the modern era of world history. At the end of this presentation, you will be expected to be able to demonstrate your understanding of these six learning objectives. One, explain how environmental factors contributed to industrialization from 1750 to 1900. Two, explain how different modes and locations of production have developed and changed over time. Three, explain the causes and effects of economic strategies of different states and empires. Four, explain the development of economic systems, ideologies, and institutions, and how they contributed to change in the period from 1750 to 1900. Five, explain the causes and effects of calls for changes in industrial societies from 1750 to 1900. And six, explain how industrialization caused change in existing social hierarchies and standards of living. In our study of world history, we will divide the development of industrialization into two, the first industrial revolution and the second industrial revolution. The first industrial revolution occurred between 1750 and 1870 and was led by England. England's leadership in the first industrial revolution was most characterized by innovations in the mechanization of textiles, the production and application of steam power, and new methods of iron metallurgy and iron's new applications. The First Industrial Revolution resulted in the beginning of the factory system, as labor and production moved from the homes and into workshops with mechanized production methods. The engine behind the First Industrial Revolution was coal, as innovations in energy production progressed throughout the late 18th and 19th centuries. Transportation was altered in the First Industrial Revolution and included the development and application of the steam engine. Even communication technologies advanced in the First Industrial Revolution as telegraph communication was invented and expanded upon in the middle of the 19th century. The Second Industrial Revolution occurred between 1870 and 1914, and in Europe was led by Germany. Outside of Europe, the Second Industrial Revolution was led by the United States. Germany and America's leadership in the Second Industrial Revolution was most characterized by innovations in the mechanization of steel production, chemicals, and electricity. The Second Industrial Revolution resulted in the progression and increased efficiency of the factory system, with innovations such as the assembly line and the addition of multiple work shifts as factories were electrified and illuminated. The engine behind the Second Industrial Revolution was really both petroleum and electricity, and energy production reached unprecedented levels in human history. Transportation was altered even more so than ever before, with the addition of electric railway and streetcars, the internal combustion engine, the invention and production of the automobile, the development of the Zeppelin, and the construction of the first airplane. Communication technologies advanced well beyond their first industrial revolution predecessors, with innovations in the electric telegraph that could expand across entire oceans the telephone, and the development of radio. 
However, industrialization did not emerge out of nothing. In fact, 18th century England had several unique characteristics that made it a special place for the beginnings of the Industrial Revolution. If you will, there were a series of many revolutions that were transpiring in England at the time. One such mini revolution was the second agricultural revolution, which led to higher agricultural production yields than in centuries past. England began an enclosure movement, which saw the privatization of formerly peasant commune lands throughout the rural regions. Peasant communal lands were worked for predominantly subsistent levels of food production. Very little surplus was cultivated for commercial purposes and sold in the nearest village markets. However, once those lands were privatized, the purpose of the land drastically changed. Once commercial production became the priority, more land went into cultivation and production yields increased. England was also benefiting from new farming techniques and technologies. For example, the use of nitrogen replenishing crops, such as turnips, allowed for continued high agricultural production yields. The practice of crop rotation had been around for a long time in England, but now instead of having a field laid barren for a season, farmers could grow turnips. Turnips helped to replenish the necessary nitrogen levels in the soil and they could also be consumed. New agricultural technology, such as the seed drill, enabled more efficient planting of seeds, which turned more lands into commercial farmland with higher production yields. 18th century England also experienced an early demographic revolution. Higher production yields from lands in England combined with increased food production from overseas through the Columbian Exchange allowed for populations to be sustained longer. As more food was produced, the experience of famine and malnutrition lessened throughout England. Childhood diseases, whose consequences were more severe and lethal in children who were malnourished, started to kill fewer and fewer children as nutrition improved. In the early 19th century, English scientist Edward Jenner discovered the vaccine for smallpox. Before long, many of the world's deadliest diseases from pre-industrial times were diminished in their impact on human life. Mortality rates slowed down and populations increased as they were enabled to age. 18th century England was also blessed with its ready supplies of raw materials that were instrumental in promoting industrial growth. For example, England's abundance of coal allowed for a new power source and newly invented machines to harness coal's power into more industrial production techniques, a sort of energy revolution. English inventor Thomas Newcomen invented the atmospheric engine in the early 18th century, and through the heating of water and the production of steam, a fulcrum or lever could be moved, which could then be used to pump water out of coal mines. Draining coal mines was important as having too much water in the mine shaft was dangerous and could lead to drowning deaths of coal miners working in the mine. Scottish inventor James Watt improved on the technology with his late 18th century invention of a steam engine. By developing new parts and methods to harness more steam power, Watt's steam engine became more efficient than previous inventions. England also had an abundance of iron ore, which was basically rocks with iron in them. The iron could be extracted from the iron ore through smelting processes. Once smelted, iron could be forged or cast by blacksmiths to produce tools, weapons, machine parts, bars, nails, hinges, and other hardware items. Eventually, iron was used to develop bridges, railroads, locomotives, and train cars. England's abundance of iron ore and its improved techniques in iron metallurgy throughout the 18th and 19th centuries enabled England to lead the way in iron production and in the development of iron's applications in construction, 
infrastructure, and transportation. Between England's energy revolution and this abundance of iron, and even new iron production techniques, the nation was able to experience an 18th century transportation revolution. In spite of being geographically blessed with numerous rivers, the English continued to alter the natural landscape of their country. Canals were dug and thoroughfares and turnpikes were blazed so that once disconnected towns and villages could be connected in a commercial sense. Inspired by coal rail lines and coal carts, by the early 19th century, England began to lay railroad across its country. Steam-powered locomotives, designed by English civil engineer George Stevenson, would carry mineral resources to newly forming industrial sites throughout England. The transportation revolution not only changed England's physical landscape, but it changed the entire game of commercial enterprise within England. England would also involve itself in the engineering of steamships and follow the American leadership of Robert Fulton's Claremont and began to develop steamships that could traverse the world's oceans. Like the railroads changed the game of commercial enterprise within England, the steamship would change the game of commercial enterprise outside of England. 18th century England was also characterized by a bit of a market revolution. Mercantilism, the economic practice of early modern Europe, was challenged during the Age of Enlightenment by the physiocrats. The physiocrats believed that wealth was not measured in the state coffers and treasuries, but that a nation's true wealth was found in its productive land. Physiocrats argued that the practice of mercantilism and governmental regulations, such as tariffs, taxes, and restrictions, actually hurt a nation's wealth. The physiocrats believed that mercantilist practices should be ended so that a nation's wealth was no longer jeopardized by its faulty policies. In essence, the physiocrats believed in natural law and laissez-faire economics, or a governmental hands-off approach to the economy. The natural forces of supply and demand would dictate production and consumption, and ultimately dictate price. Scottish economist Adam Smith articulated laissez-faire economics in his work, The Wealth of Nations, in 1776. He also claimed that the value of a commodity was equal to the amount of labor that was used in the production of that commodity. For Smith, land and labor and their productive capacities were the true wealth of nations. As England moved away from mercantilism and more into classical economics, commercial activity, technological innovation, and material consumption would thrive. During the middle of the 18th century, technological and economic transitions were also afoot in England that would lead to drastic changes in production techniques and labor systems. Proto-industrial practices, such as the free peasantry's textile production within the cottage industry, were progressing in technology and productivity. For example, English inventor John Kay and his flying shuttle made weaving with a hand loom more efficient. The flying shuttle enabled weavers to weave larger pieces of woolen cloth much more rapidly, as the device seemingly flew the weft or woolen thread quickly through the warp, or the stationary thread. Richard Arkwright, also an English inventor, invented the spinning frame, which was powered by human muscle power, turning a wheel that would turn gears. Those gears would feed wool or cotton around a spindle. This enabled English spinners to produce more cotton and woolen thread and yarn, which could then be woven into cloth. Eventually, Arkwright added water power to his machine and called it the water frame, which freed up spinners from turning the gears to be able to feed the cotton or wool through the spindles more efficiently. English inventor James Hargreaves also increased cotton spinning production with his invention, the spinning jenny. Samuel Crompton, also an English inventor, invented the spinning mule, 
which was even more productive than the spinning jenny and became too large for most homes and cottages or workshops. These 18th century technologies in textile production not only increased woolen and cotton textile production and met growing demands for textiles in Europe, but also led to England replacing India as the world's leading cotton textile producer. These machines helped to revolutionize production techniques and labor systems in England, as well as both work and workers left the homes and entered mills and factories. The emergent factory system, or a sort of labor revolution, became the archetype for mass production and industrial labor in numerous industries beyond textile production throughout the 19th century. England's leadership in the first industrial revolution was predicated on environmental factors within their own nation and their global maritime-based empire. As more and more societies sought to industrialize, as in the case of Northern and Western European societies, North American societies, and nations such as Russia and Japan, harnessing environmental resources contributed to their industrialization. Environmental factors that contributed to the growth of industrial production included a society's proximity to waterways, access to rivers and canals, geographical distribution of coal, iron, and timber, levels of urbanization, improvements in agricultural productivity, legal protection of private property, access to foreign resources, and the accumulation of capital. As new modes of production developed and changed over time, the world's locations as centers for production began to change as well. For example, the rapid development of steam-powered industrial production in European countries and the United States contributed to the increase in these regions' share of global manufacturing during the first industrial revolution. As new methods of industrial production became more common in parts of northwestern Europe, they spread to other parts of Europe and the United States, Russia, and Japan. In effect, traditional locations that had been centers of production began to decline in their shares of global manufacturing. Although Middle Eastern and Asian countries continued to produce manufactured goods, these regions' share in global manufacturing declined significantly. This was most evident in the shipbuilding industries of India, and Southeast Asian societies. Iron production in India and textile production in India and Egypt. Many world historians argue that industrialization created a global north-south divide with an industrialized northern hemisphere and an industrialized underdeveloped southern hemisphere between 1750 and 1900. new technologies and means of communication and transportation from the first and second industrial revolutions resulted in more fully integrated national economies, a higher level of urbanization, and a truly global economic network. New technologies such as the Bessemer process of steel production, mass production, electricity, and chemicals allowed for more high quality products within a more urbanized landscape in Europe, the United States, Western Russia, and Japan, especially by the late 19th century. The Second Industrial Revolution also resulted in innovations and improvements in factory systems, with the addition of the assembly line. Even in steel production, factory production was enhanced, as seen in the Krupp family's steel factories throughout Germany. Krupp steel was also utilized to mass produce steel products, such as automotive technologies, elevator systems, shipbuilding, and firearms. Developments in communication, such as the telegraph, the telephone, and the radio, and developments in transportation, such as railroads, steamships, streetcars, and trolleys, the internal combustion engine and automobiles and airplanes allowed for more integrated national economies and a truly global economic network. 
these new, more efficient methods of transportation and other innovations created new industries, improved the distribution of goods, increased consumerism, and enhanced the quality of life for people living within industrialized societies. Members of industrialized societies enjoyed the benefits of greater access to food and finished products, thanks to new and more efficient methods of transportation and other innovations, such as steamships, railroads, refrigerated rail cars, and ice boxes. As well, streetcars and bicycles allowed for much more mobility for people living within industrialized urban centers. These urban innovations allowed for more leisure time and leisure activities, such as spectator sports and sports clubs, more public parks, public beaches, department stores, museums, theaters, and opera houses with a more aesthetic urban landscape. While Western European countries abandoned mercantilism and began adopting free trade policies, partly in response to the growing acceptance of Adam Smith's theories of laissez-faire capitalism and free markets, industrialization was able to progress. The global nature of trade and production contributed to the proliferation of large-scale transnational businesses. Examples of some of the world's most successful transnational businesses by 1900 included an investment company called the Hong Kong and Shanghai Banking Corporation, a soap production company called Lever Brothers, eventually Unilever, based in England and the Netherlands, but operated in British West Africa and the Belgian Congo, a diamond company called De Beers, food and beverage companies like Nestle, a chocolate company based in Switzerland, Lipton, an English tea company, and Coca-Cola, United Fruit, and Dole, based in the United States. Oil companies like Shell from the Netherlands and Standard Oil from the United States, and Levi's, an American clothing company. These multinationals came to rely on new practices in banking and finance, such as the buying and selling of their company's stock shares in stock markets and developing limited liability corporations so as to take advantage of tax laws and existent business practices. This economic shift, along with better harvests, caused in part by the commercialization of agriculture, promoted population growth, longer life expectancy, and lowered infant mortality. This resulted in a heightened consumerism, especially due to the productivity and accessibility of resources and goods during the Second Industrial Revolution. The development of industrial capitalism led to increased standards of living for some and to continued improvement in manufacturing methods that increased the availability, affordability, and variety of consumer goods. Mass marketing in the late 19th and early 20th centuries included print and public advertising, the opening of department stores, and the production and distribution of catalogs in which people in rural parts of Europe and other industrializing societies could order goods that were not immediately available. New social developments during the first industrial revolution had far-reaching consequences on human societies. One such consequence was increased populations, and more specifically, increased urban populations. With migration from rural to urban areas in industrialized regions, cities came to experience a variety of challenges, including pollution, poverty, increased crime, public health crises, housing shortages, and insufficient infrastructure to accommodate urban growth. Europe's population exploded during the First Industrial Revolution. In 1750, Europe's population stood at approximately 140 million people. By 1800, the population had risen to approximately 187 million people. And by 1850, Europe's population had climbed to nearly 270 million people, which meant the population of Europe almost doubled in a century. London's population mimicked that exponential growth and suffered many consequences of overcrowding and urban poverty. 
The city's population in 1810 stood at approximately 1 million people. But by 1850, the population had more than doubled to 2.3 million people. At that point in the 19th century, more than 50% of England's population lived in towns and cities rather than in rural villages and farmlands. Similar trends happened in the United States, Germany, and Russia during the Second Industrial Revolution. All three of those nations achieved cities with more than one million people before the year 1900. In industrialized societies, socioeconomic changes created divisions of labor that led to the development of self-conscious classes, including the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. The distinction between the bourgeoisie and the working class became greater during the first industrial revolution. For example, bourgeois families became focused on the nuclear family and a cult of domesticity in which women were expected to have piety, purity, domesticity, and submissiveness and be the light of the home. On the other hand, proletariat or working class families lived in row houses in the downtowns of cities, and every member of the family was expected to work, including fathers, mothers, and children. The first industrial revolution allowed for improvements in the proletarian quality of life. In response to the social and economic changes brought about by industrial capitalism, some governments, organizations, and individuals promoted various types of political, social, educational, and urban reforms. For example, three important acts passed by the English Parliament included the Factory Act of 1833, the Mines Act of 1842, and the Ten Hours Act of 1847. The Factory Act of 1833 mandated that children from the ages of 9 to 13 could only work for eight-hour shifts, and children from the ages of 13 to 18 could only work 12-hour shifts. The Mines Act of 1842 made it unlawful for boys under 10 and women to work in coal mines. And the Ten Hours Act of 1847 reduced the workday to 10 hours for women and for children aged 13 to 18. In industrialized states, many workers organized themselves, often in labor unions, to improve working conditions, limit hours, and gain higher wages. In some cases, the ideology of socialism influenced the development of workers' movements and political parties, such as socialist, social democratic, and labor parties. These socialist-influenced political parties emerged in the democratizing states of Europe and the United States. In other cases, the newly established power structures of industrialized societies encouraged the development of more radicalized ideologies, including those espoused by Karl Marx and the idea of communism, which generated new visions for industrialized societies. Patterns of industrialization varied among nations as the Second Industrial Revolution progressed. The next several slides will compare and contrast the patterns of industrialization of four select nations during the Second Industrial Revolution. Germany, the United States, Japan, and Russia. We will compare and contrast the pacing and timing of industrialization the shape and size of industrialization, the role of the nation's governments in industrialization, the expression of the nation's social conflict as the nation industrialized, and each nation's major industrial developments during the Second Industrial Revolution. In the German states, industrialization did not begin until after the Napoleonic Wars ended in 1815, but picked up pace after 1871, when Germany became a single, unified nation-state. So Germany's timing and pace was late, but rapid. Germany would come to lead continental European states in industrialization, and nearly caught up to England by 1900 in production levels. 
Germany was one of the two leading nations in the Second Industrial Revolution. In the United States, industrialization began in the late 18th century, so its timing and pace was early and rapid, especially compared to other Western Hemispheric societies. The United States led the Western Hemisphere in industrial development, while Latin American societies remained agrarian with limited industry. In fact, the United States would become the world's leader in industry and production by 1914. In Japan, industrialization began late, as it did not start until the late 19th century. However, Japan's industrialization was rapid compared to the rest of the Far East, as it was the first nation to industrialize in Asia, as China failed to do so, and other parts of Asia fell to Western imperialism. Japan would become the most industrialized nation in Asia by 1914, and would come to militarily dominate the Far East with its military victories against China in the Sino-Japanese War in 1895 and Russia in the Russo-Japanese War in 1905. In Russia, industrialization was both late and slow. Russia did not begin to take steps toward industrialization until late in the 19th century. Russia had many roadblocks to industrialization, which included their economy remaining predominantly agrarian, and their political system remaining archaic with an autocratic ruler. Additionally, Russia's nobles and its religious clerics did not prioritize industrialization. Germany experienced a relatively nationwide industrialization after 1871. The national and ethnic unity of the German people enabled greater industrial development as the nation and its government prioritized German industrialization. In fact, Germany's percentage of total world production grew five times between 1750 and 1900. However, in the United States, industrialization was more regionally based when compared to Germany's nationwide industrialization. The United States had a large geographic zone with demographic and economic differences, which inhibited nationwide industrial development. Predominantly, industrialization was most evident in the north and northeast regions of the United States. In the south and the west, industrial development was severely limited as those regions remained predominantly agrarian. In spite of those regional differences, the United States' percentage of total world production grew 23 times between 1750 and 1900. Japan, like Germany, experienced a nationwide industrialization throughout the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Likewise, the national and ethnic unity of the Japanese people enabled greater industrial development. Japan's physical size, being smaller than the other industrializing nations, may have enabled its nationwide industrialization to occur. However, on the world stage, Japan's percentage of total world production actually declined between 1750 and 1900. Russia, like the United States, experienced a regionally based industrialization throughout the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Russia also had a large geographic zone with demographic, economic, and ethnic differences that inhibited nationwide industrial development. Western Russia was the industrial zone of the Russian Empire, as limitations to industrial development characterized the lands east of the Ural Mountains, like in Siberia. However, Russia's percentage of total world production doubled between 1750 and 1900. In 1871, the newly unified German nation's industrial development garnered a lot of political support by its head of state, Kaiser Wilhelm I, and its chancellor, Otto von Bismarck. Otto von Bismarck's blood and iron speech in support of German military and industrial development showcased Germany's priorities as it sought to surge past England 
as Europe's leader in industrialization. As chancellor, Bismarck pandered to the different political and social groups within Germany. For example, he extended health insurance to German workers as a nationalist supporting socialism. But when needed, he attempted to permanently disband Germany's Social Democratic Party, as he saw it as a threat to his own authority. Nonetheless, Bismarck's support allowed for Germany to become the most industrialized nation in Europe by the outbreak of World War I. In the United States, the federal government allowed for the development of corporations, multinationals, and monopolies to form. These new economic developments definitely pushed American industrial development to new heights throughout the late 19th century. Additionally, the federal government extended federal land grants, which was essentially free land, to railroad and telegraph companies. These land grants also contributed to America's increased industrial development. Prior to the late 19th century, Japan, under the Tokugawa shogunate, remained isolated and in many ways unaffected by a lot of the global economic trends of the first industrial revolution. However, external pressure to open Japan's economy by the United States and England would ultimately force the Japanese government to open its economy and market to the developing world. In fact, American naval commodore Matthew Perry led a fleet of American naval vessels in 1853, charged with informing the Tokugawa shogunate of American President Millard Fillmore's plan to establish commercial relations with Japan at Tokyo. This act of aggression initially garnered Japanese resistance, but eventually Japan would come to accept trade with the United States and other Western nations. In fact, as the overthrow of the Tokugawa shogunate occurred during the 1860s, and with the new Japanese government led by a reinstated emperor, Japan began its rapid industrialization. This period became known as the Meiji Restoration, which began in 1868. The Meiji government supported industrial development and large Japanese corporations called zaibatsus. One of the earliest and most successful zaibatsus was a conglomerate that led to the development in mining, shipbuilding, electronics, automotive, steel, oil and gas, and chemicals. That Zaibatsu was called Mitsubishi. In Russia, industrialization was initiated and controlled by the Russian czars of the late 19th century. Russian czars were motivated by Russia's loss in the Crimean War to the alliance of England, France, and the Ottoman Empire in 1856. One of the first steps taken by Russia's czars was the abolition of serfdom. Serfdom, the archaic agricultural labor system of Russia, was abolished via imperial decree by Tsar Alexander II in 1861. The goal of the abolition of serfdom was to initiate a period of greater agricultural and industrial production. The reasoning given by Tsar Alexander II was that a free peasantry, as opposed to an unfree serfdom, would be more productive. Although Russia did begin to industrialize, the plight of the newly emancipated Russian peasantry did not improve drastically. Later, under Tsar Nicholas II, Russian railroad construction increased greatly. Under the Witt system, named after Russian statesman and financial minister Sergei Witt, Russia developed the Trans-Siberian Railway, which connected Russia's industrialized cities west of the Urals, like Moscow and St. Petersburg, with the eastern extent of the Russian Empire in the city of Vladivostok, which bordered Korea and China. The Trans-Siberian Railway enabled Russia's industrial west to tap into its resource-rich East and increase its nation's industrial production and output. Germany, the United States, Japan, and Russia were not the only nations whose governments sought industrialization and modernization. In fact, in response to the expansion of industrializing states, some governments in Asia and Africa 
sought to reform and modernize their economies and militaries. Many governmental leaders believed their countries were vulnerable to industrializing nations that were encroaching on their resources and territories in the late 19th century. Both the Ottoman and the Chinese governments sought to reform and modernize their economies and militaries so as to resist more developed nations' advancements. In the Ottoman Empire, the sultans passed a series of reforms known as the Tanzimat Reforms, which sought to modernize and secularize the Ottoman Empire's legal system, educational system, and its military, specifically its Janissary Corps. Likewise, in China, the Qing Dynasty initiated the self-strengthening movement in an attempt to modernize China's military and initiate its industrial development while retaining its Confucian traditions. In both cases, the reform efforts of the Tanzimat movement in the Ottoman Empire and the self-strengthening movement in China were resisted by conservatives and established elite groups. Islamic clerics believed the Tanzimat reforms disrespected Islamic traditions within the empire and gave way to Western culture replacing Islamic culture in the Middle East. Likewise, many Confucian scholars and Chinese noble families saw the self-strengthening movement as having been too friendly and receptive to Western culture, and they took action to reduce the reform movement's momentum. Both the Ottoman Empire and the Qing Dynasty in China failed to industrialize and modernize to the level of Germany, the United States, Japan, and Russia, and by 1914, that was problematic for them, as they remained vulnerable to the more industrially developed nations. Industrialization did not come without discontent from various social groups. How those discontented groups expressed the social conflict in their respective countries varied in each of those countries. In Germany after 1871, for example, the parliament, especially its Reichstag, saw a number of Social Democratic Party members elected to power. Chancellor Bismarck and Kaiser Wilhelm I were not supportive of socialism and Germany's Social Democratic Party. In spite of their attempts to permanently ban the Social Democratic Party, socialism survived in Germany and forced the German government to enact protections and benefits for its working class. Bismarck, as a practitioner of real politic, enforced a practical method of governance, void of loyalty to a single set of morals or political ideals, in order to strengthen Germany. In essence, there were points in his chancellorship where he supported workers when he deemed it necessary, but there were points where he took shots against worker-friendly political parties and groups when he deemed it necessary. Unlike in European nations, labor, communist, Socialist and Social Democratic parties did not gain popularity in the United States. Therefore, labor protests and industrial worker strikes happened frequently throughout the Second Industrial Revolution in the United States. Oftentimes, those worker strikes became violent, as in the case of the Haymarket Riot in 1886 and the Pullman Strike in 1894, both in Chicago, Illinois. Eventually, the development of the Populist Party occurred, which sought to serve farmers' interests and combated policies that enabled industrial development. Like in Germany and the United States, in Japan the working class suffered a plight, as its demands often combated with the demands of the Meiji government. Japan's new constitution, drafted in 1889, created an imperial diet, basically the Japanese parliament. Yet no Japanese socialist parties ever formed until the 1920s. In essence, unions and organized strikes were illegal in Meiji Japan, as socialism was losing to capitalism within Japan. Because of this, Japan's working class suffered immense poverty and hardship. Russia's working class also suffered in a backward political system, like that of Tsarist Russia. Before 1905, there was no representative assembly in Russia, and political parties were illegal. 
This meant that there were no worker-friendly political parties in Russia, or at least none that were legally recognized. This resulted in violence by Marxists and anarchists against political leaders, including the assassination of Tsar Alexander II in 1881. Eventually, the rise of an illegal political party called the Social Democratic Labor Party, which was influenced by Marxism, emerged. Beyond that, the development of worker councils called Soviets emerged in Russia's major industrial cities, like Moscow and St. Petersburg. These Soviets were worker councils who tried to implement local change that provided benefits and guarantees of improved worker conditions, wages, and hours. However, the Russian government failed to support workers' endeavors and garnered many worker demonstrations. One such demonstration occurred in St. Petersburg in 1905. The peaceful demonstration of Russian workers concluded with Tsar Nicholas II's Imperial Guards firing their guns into the crowd of demonstrators. This violent reaction and ensuing deaths became known as Bloody Sunday in Russia. In spite of setbacks to working class peoples in these nations, industrialization occurred in varying levels. In Germany, iron, steel, and chemical production thrived. Coal production also increased immensely. Railroads expanded and Germany also became Europe's leader in the production of automobiles. Industrialization allowed the United States to lead the way in numerous industries. For example, the United States led the way in steel, assembly line manufacturing, the development and use of interchangeable parts, mass marketing and distribution, railroads, rubber production, mining, automobiles, aviation, telegraph and telephone communication, and electricity. Japan would come to lead Asian nations in railroads, cotton and silk textiles, armaments, and naval development such as shipbuilding. Captured in Fukuzawa Yukishi's Goodbye Asia, the sentiment was Japan was to be the industrial leader of Asia and was to leave the ranks of such backward and archaic Asian races. He wrote in 1885, quote, Once the wind of Western civilization blows to the east, every blade of grass and every tree in the east follow what the western wind brings. We do not have time to wait for the enlightenment of our neighbors so that we can work together toward the development of Asia. It is better for us to leave the ranks of Asian nations and cast our lot with civilized nations of the West. We should deal with them exactly as the Westerners do. Russia would come to advance its railroads. Its greatest railroad accomplishment was the Trans-Siberian Railway, which stretches more than 5,700 miles across the Eurasian landmass. Russia also came to be a world leader in coal and oil production, as well as steel production. 